I have no idea. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I am not a part of the program, but you know, give me a microphone and I'm, I'm there. Um, my name is Teresa Newman. I'm one of the directors um, of the Wrongful Convictions Clinic here. And before we get, this is a fascinating uh, panel. I can't wait to hear from it. I'm going to turn it over to the organizer, Renata Gomez, in one second. But there's a preliminary question. It really is just a question that will help kind of shape uh, where we go with the panel. So is, is anyone in the audience from North Carolina? Is anyone from North Carolina from Edenton, North Carolina? And is there, are there any prosecutors in the, in the audience? <laughs> I, you know. Nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing, yeah. well, yeah, a little bit, but not yeah, too much. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, nothing yeah, to be yeah, ashamed yeah. of. Um, nothing at all Somebody's to be ashamed of. Somebody's gonna do it. Okay, so I think we'll go, that was just the preliminary question I, I was interested in, so I think that I will sit down and turn it over to my, um, to my colleague, uh, Renata Gomez. So I was being pointed at, I wasn't sure why. There. Go ahead. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. It is my distinct pleasure to have this panel here. Uh, this case was a really infamous in North Carolina about the Little Rascals Daycare Center and there were numerous children who were coming forth falsely uh, alleging that there was sexual assault and molestation going on. So unfortunately, Mr. Kelly was the director of, of the daycare and was falsely imprisoned for about six years, if, I, if I'm correct. So from your left to your right, uh, we have Mr. Lou Powell, who is a journalist working for the Charlotte Observer. He worked there for about 35 years. To his left, we have uh, our exoneree, Robert Kelly, and then Mark Montgomery, who is, was his attorney who got him exonerated and uh, Ms. Behrens, who works with our library, who was able to work with these three people to have the archives. So after the event, you guys are more than welcome to come down and look at the materials we got from the case. There's some newspaper clippings, a shirt that people were wearing in Edenton. It just goes to show the gravity of, of this type of case that was happening around North Carolina. So, so to begin the panel, I just wanted to have each of you guys talk about your role in the case. And then we'll take it from there. And I'm gonna start with Mark Montgomery since he's the attorney. Okay, um, <laughs> I was the appellate attorney. I wasn't the trial lawyer. Uh, I was working with the appellate defender's office, which is uh, what it sounds like here in North Carolina. Um, I specialized in and do specialize in uh, cases of alleged child sexual abuse. I say specialized, I, when I joined the appellate defender's office, it was like freshman hazing. You had to take the child sex case appeals because they were so awful. Uh, and I soon discovered that whatever there is that drew me into criminal law to begin with is most intense in cases of child sexual abuse. The emotions run high, uh, judges look the other way, prosecutors see red, defense lawyers uh, sometimes shy away from doing their job and the result is a mess. And it was getting worse and worse. Um, and this case came along at a time when nobody was really paying much attention to the law regarding child sex abuse. They were paying attention to the publicity about child sex abuse around the country. Lots of cases, what Lou and others now call the child sex abuse hysteria of the 80s was running <coughs> rampant um, when this case got started. Anyway, after uh, uh, eight months of trial, the longest in North Carolina history, uh, and 27,000 pages of transcript, which I had to read and take notes on, um, I came up with uh, 22 issues to raise in the Court of Appeals. Uh, and the one that uh, I think ultimately turned the tail, or whatever, fill in the expression, um, was something that happened quite by accident. Um, as Renata said, there were a lot of kids involved I would correct her briefly to say when kids weren't coming forward, they were being drawn into. It took months and months of anxious parents and would-be uh, child sex abuse experts grilling, uh, repeatedly interrogating kids, uh, getting more and more 
uh, false, uh, weird, and ultimately false allegations from them. It spread, so if Kid A mentioned Kid B ha having been there, then uh, Kid B became a uh, you know, potential victim, and that kid got interrogated until he came or she came up with allegations. And it didn't stop at one. Kids were being given, getting rewards for coming, for disclosing about Mr. Bob. Um, uh, they would have Mr. Bob night where they'd sit down after dinner and talk about all the nasty things that Mr. Bob did to them at the daycare, all unbeknownst to anybody at the time. So anyway, um, all bunch of kids were interviewed. Um, many kids said nothing happened. Um, 29 kids said something did happen. Um, the prosecution decided to proceed on just 12 kids. Uh, and they put the rest of the uh, uh, interviews aside and didn't turn them over to the defense. The defense made it move to discover those uh, other statements, you know, the statements from the kids that said nothing happened. Uh, prosecution, not surprisingly, decided not to turn that over to the defense. The defense team was on the ball. They made a motion to force the state to turn it over to them. Um, they made it in front of Judge Brad Bird Tilly, uh, good guy, uh, honest, straightforward, even-handed, just the kind of judge that prosecutors hate. So <laughs> he, he ruled that they had to turn it over to him. He'd put it in a box, he would read them, and whatever would be uh, helpful to Bob would be turned over to the defense. Well, the state did that grudgingly, and then they got rid of Judge Tillery. They made a motion to appeal his ruling. Um, the motion lost, but in the process, he said they pretty much accused uh, the judge of being uh, underhanded and biased and all that kind of stuff. And the judge, unfortunately, took himself out of the case in the interest of not appearing to have judicial leanings. And he was replaced by a judge that the prosecutors really did like. And that judge never looked at that stuff. So anyway, one day uh, the trial lawyers and I were over in the clerk's office looking through some exhibits. And lo and behold, we came across a box. And in that box were the interviews of the kids that said that nothing happened or said things that were in conflict with the 12 kids that the state was going to proceed on. So I, it was supposed to have been sealed. It was not sealed. Um, I sealed it, took it to the Court of Appeals, and the lead, article, the lead issue, one of the lead issues on the appeal was that we should have gotten that, the defense should have gotten that material in order to prepare for trial. And that's one of the reasons that the Court of Appeals awarded a new trial. Uh, another reason was that Bob's first lawyer um, turned on him uh, because he had a kid at the daycare, um, and the prosecution, Brenda Toppin and some of the other witch hunters, uh, convinced him that his kid was a victim. And so not only did he collaborate with the prosecution, he uh, testified against Bob at his trial, uh, and then became a judge, and retired as a judge in 2014. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's my involvement, is to, was just to follow through on the appeal, and um, no, I'm not sure what else to say. Okay, so now, Mr. Kelly? I'm sorry, Mr. Powell. Why don't you let him go? Yeah. I'm, I'm least important. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, eye candy. <laughs> well, I can't compete with that. Uh, I got interested in the Little Rascals case in the 1990s, when I saw uh, an episode of a uh, frontline documentary called Innocence Lost. It was directed by Ofra Bakel, and over three years, or actually over five years, a total of eight hours of documentary footage aired on Frontline. Uh, it was an extraordinary um, piece of work, and it was instantly persuasive to me. I, I wanted to uh, do something about it at that time. I worked at the Charlotte Observer, was not, was not a reporter, and I uh, did not have the opportunity to do anything about it until I got laid off 10 years ago, which gave me a lot of free time. Uh, so at that point, I started a website, started a Facebook page, and my two purposes are to uh, persuade the state of North Carolina to issue a statement of innocence for the Edenton Seven 
similar to what they gave the defendants in the Duke Cross case. As, uh, as Professor Newman has reminded me several times, this is not an easy thing to have happen. But <clears throat> it took 300 years for the Salem witches to be exonerated by the state of Massachusetts, so I may not be around when that finally happens. The uh, other thing that I want to do is to create an archive on the case. And fortunately, that has been easier to uh, have happen. Thanks first to uh, Melanie Dunshee, who accepted the papers uh, from the case that passed from uh, Mark to Bob to me. And then now uh, Jennifer Behrens and Lee Cloninger, who has done the wonderful work of uh, creating fin finding aid for these papers. It's 17 boxes, or maybe more than that, of papers from the trial, primarily the trial transcript. This was in the pre-internet age, so these papers may very well be the only original documentation of this trial, unless somebody has got some floppy disks stuck in their attic somewhere. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's where we are now, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to um, uh, what can be done with these papers. I hope they will be digitized at some point, and I hope that the website, uh, that's littlerascalsdaycarecase.org, and we have uh, some cards here for anybody who wants to look at them, just look for the big exonerate. Uh, so I, I hope that that, that uh, website will be preserved and, and expanded on. Uh, this was part of, uh, this case was part of what is now known to sociologists as a moral panic, a satanic ritual abuse daycare moral panic. The main, uh, the, the original uh, episode of this was the McMartin case in Manhattan Beach, California. Uh, it started maybe, maybe a couple of years before, mm -hmm. before Little Rascals but they had many, many uh, creepy similarities. There were other cases across the country too. Nobody knows exactly what caused all this. It was kind of a confluence of unlikely um, uh, events, uh, everything from uh, uh, Freud and Freud's changed uh, opinion about uh, 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 abuse of, uh, of women that was taken up by the feminism movement uh, and then it sort of bumped over to from believe the women to believe the children. Um, if that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, it's just, it's just part of it. And there was also a lot of religious involvement and this was also going on at the same time that uh, afternoon TV uh, talk shows were in their heyday, and this was just right up, the satanic ritual abuse was right up their alley. Um, at, at, um, and I want to mention one other episode. Well, let, let me just mention a couple of other things. There were so many things that could have kept Bob Kelly from being convicted. If only Jane Mabry, who was uh, an unhappy mother, uh, at Little Rascals, if she had not become upset and had become uh, someone who spread rumors about um, uh, satanic, well, she didn't exactly charge the satanic ritual abuse herself, but it morphed from one thing into another. If she had not become upset, uh, there would there would have been no trial. If Brenda Toppin, who was a police dispatcher, if you can believe this, this was her, this was her training, being a police dispatcher, but she got interested in uh, satanic ritual abuse at a weekend conference at Kill Devil Hills, which was also attended by uh, the DA in uh, Edenton, H.P. Uh, Williams Jr., uh, and um, the chief uh, turned out to be the chief therapist in the case. So this, this was like the, uh, um, this was like patient zero in this, in this case. And it, it, it 
coincided with Jane Mabry and uh, everything just happened at once. And at the same time, there's in the air uh, everywhere really in the country this uh, fascination with Satanism. I'm, I'm going to read something very briefly here. He's doing that. Yes. The FBI at the time was so uh, concerned that this was this widespread notion that there's this underground, sinister uh, group of people, network of people, if you will, that they it, uh, went, did an investigation. They created a task force and they went out looking for where are they, see if we can find them. And not, they couldn't come up with any, anything to substantiate this notion that this, there's an underground network of Satanists and, and sadists out there. At the same time, the same year that this was going on, here are two paragraphs from an Associated Press story. Perplexed law enforcement agencies statewide, North Carolina, have been fielding inquiries for weeks about stubborn but unfounded rumors of a plan by unidentified Satan worshipers to kidnap and sacrifice children. The most common variation is that a satanic cult plans to abduct, abduct one or more blonde-haired, blue-eyed children between the ages of two and five for a human sacrifice at Halloween. All of these parents, this is from a detective in Garner, all these parents of blonde-eyed, blue-eyed children are frantic. I bet I received 500 phone calls from mothers saying they were going to dye their children's hair. So this, this, is, in, this is all in the air at the time that this is happening. Um, I want to mention one other thing. There's two people I want to say thanks to before uh, I yield. One is Steve Johnston, who is the webmaster for the site, uh, littlerascalsdaycare.org. He's just been incredible. And also David Loomis, who is sitting in the front seat with his camera. Uh, he did a terrific piece of work uh, at UNC on how the case was covered by uh, the news media. In a, in a nutshell, it was not covered very well. It, uh, if the great news media had been more aggressive um, and willing to dig into the story more, it's another thing that might have might have happened that would have prevented a trial. Okay. All right. So, Ms. Do you want to talk? About sure. Although I'll have to disagree with Mr. Kelly. I think I am the least important person at this table. <laughs> not just because my uh, involvement in the case was not as direct, but as Lou indicated, my involvement in the collection was less direct since I inherited it from Melanie Dunchy, who was our longtime assistant director uh, who retired last summer. And I also did not do the heavy lifting as far as organizing uh, and making the finding aid for that collection. As Lou indicated, that was Lee, who was in the front row, who uh, spent the better part of a year, I think, sorting through uh, approximately 11,850 items, according to his finding aid putting these materials together and making them discoverable to researchers uh, for the future. Um, we brought some samples here, as you see. Um, most of this material is in off-site storage for its protection to keep in a climate-controlled environment. But there are about 21 document boxes like this. This is where the t-shirt came from, or safely housed when it's not on display. Um, there are about 110 uh, black volumes, bound volumes of the trial transcript and other transcript documents that are kept together. So that's really what it looks like. We couldn't bring all of it. Uh, it would be a little voluminous, but we're very grateful to be able to make it available to researchers and help put that context of the satanic panic of the 1980s out there for researchers. Yeah. Okay. What time is class over? <laughs> <laughs> we have about four hours. <laughs> Teresa Newman. Thank you. <laughs> Jamie Lau, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you could get toward the microphone, but I can imagine it's hard to hear. Is this, this yeah. is turn it a little toward you. Is that any better? Yes. Anybody over 30 in here? <laughs> Do you remember Little Rascal started 30 years ago? Do you remember it?
My hero is Mark Montgomery. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say today, but uh, I'll get going, and if you want to stop me, just stop me. But uh, I was in jail over two years before my trial started. And uh, went through nine months of trial. <clears throat> uh, was convicted on 99 accounts, I think. Received 12 life sentences. Consecutive. Uh, had court-appointed lawyers. Uh, they couldn't have done anything. I, and I love Mike Spivey and Jeff Miller to death. They were court-appointed. And I told him, I said, y'all got me 12 life sentences. I mean, nobody could have done any better. Uh, from the first day, I was accused of child abuse. And that's, that's all I knew until my trial started. I had no idea what I was supposed to have done until the children actually started testifying. Uh, are these bills in particular up here? Oh, uh, in, in the bills in particular, if, if you read them, they first degree sex offense, crimes against nature, uh, indecent, liberties. indecent liberties, and basically that that was it. No actual what I was supposed to have done. So I was being educated uh, during my trial. Uh, Y'all know uh, David Crabtree, Channel 5? He came to see me a couple of years ago and uh, to my house, and I got him a glass of tea, and he was sitting down, and I said, you know I got a PhD, and he kind of stopped mid, and he looked at me, he, and I'm think, he's probably thinking, this is a nut. I'm not, what am I doing in here? And he sat on down, and I said, yeah, I got a PhD. I got it from CPSU. And it took him about five seconds, and he said, ah, Central Prison State University. Uh, most of what I do is because of the six years that I stayed in jail and prison. The way I treat each day. The way I appreciate things. The way I appreciate attorneys. The way I think Mark is just the bomb diggity. That's what my... <laughs> That's what Technical my, term. That's what my <laughs> that's what my grandchildren said. It's, uh, when I got out of prison, they were trying to say something about recognized, and I said, "Yeah, specognized." And so, but uh, I have a deep respect for attorneys, except prosecutors. <laughs> There's not a prosecutor I trust. There's not a prosecutor I respect. And those that gonna be prosecutors, shame on you. A prosecutor is a politician, and a politician will do what? Anything they can do to get elected. The prosecutors I have seen, they care about one thing, and that's getting a conviction. They don't give a rat's ass, pardon my French, if a person is innocent or whatnot, they want a conviction. That's all they care about. And I remember during my jury selection, in the back of the courtroom in Florida. <clears throat> we, I was trying to remember where it was tried. What? Sorry, I, I was trying to remember where it was tried. Yeah. Uh, can y'all still hear me back there? The prosecutor had an office behind the courtroom. We had an office. And I remember Mike Spivey said something to me during jury selection, or, or it was before the trial actually started. He said, uh, Something about a plea bargain. I said, okay. He said, and I don't know whether he was going to approach the prosecutor or the prosecutors had approached him, but he said something about uh, a misdemeanor. And I listened. And see, if you're convicted on a First-degree sex offense, crimes against nature, indecent liberties, it's automatic life. There's no 
right? Uh, sex offense is. Yeah. The others are it's all, not automatic like. life. So he, I listened to him, and I said, no, I'm not, don't even go to him. I'm, I'm not willing. And Jeff Miller was my other attorney. He said, look, if we go to trial and you lose, you lose big. I said, uh, I try to be a good role model for my children. I try to teach them to do what's right and to stand up for what's right. Now, I wouldn't be much of a dad if I said, well, if it gets tough, it's all right to give up and take the easy way out. I said, I wouldn't be much of a parent. I said, plus, I'd rather spend the rest of my life in prison for something I didn't do than to take a plea and said, I did it. My name was trashed for, and, and still is. And from the day, I reckon I'm rambling, but from the day one, when the accusation started, I was angry. And I'm still angry. And the biggest job that I had for the whole six years was keeping my anger under control, was staying calm, was knowing that every, everything that, everything I did would be reported back to the district attorneys and whatnot. I'm angry at what the state of North Carolina did to me. The, the three prosecutors and the therapists, they should be in prison right now today. Not only did they abuse me and my wife at that time and our children, my daughter was six years old at that time. And the hell she went through going to class every day in school and the other students taunting her and bullying <coughs> her and teasing her. It was just unexcusable. But not only am I angry at what was done to me, and the rest of us defendants. The prosecutors, anywhere from 10 to 20, 30 times said, and I believe the first time they said it was in a bond hearing in early 89, Bob Kelly may have molested as many as 90 children. So thanks to the state of North Carolina, there's 90 children that have a tag on their back that says, I have been molested according to the state of North Carolina. And I'm angry at that. I'm angry because the person that has been actually raped or molested is a horrible thing. And some are able to take it and put it over here and, and have a good life and deal with it but people that have not been molested to have to have that on their back, that's not right. And I'm angry about that. I'm not sure what else, what else you want me to say. I mean, let me, uh, let me just add one thing about Bob's <coughs> refusal to take a plea, which is way beyond what I think I'd be able to handle. Even after we won the appeal, after we won the appeal, the question came up, well, maybe we, there could be some sort of a negotiated uh, settlement so that there wouldn't have to be a, a second trial. And what did this one have to say about it? Hmm. <laughs> the answer was no. He wasn't, even after having spent six or seven, six, seven, six years in prison, knowing what it was like and knowing that it could happen all over again, uh, he was still not willing to uh, admit to doing something he didn't do. So that's hero stuff right there. There's, there's thousands, in my opinion, in prison in North Carolina that are accused of stuff that hadn't happened. And the far majority have taken a plea bargain. And it's because, and I understand this, and it's, it's the job of the attorneys to do this. They, they go to the client and say, this is what we've got. 
This is the way it is. If you're convicted, you're going to get automatic life or whatnot. Or you can take a plea and be out in five, ten years. When I was in jail, half the people I was in jail with couldn't read and write. And I was writing letters for them to judges and, and attorneys and whatnot. And I don't know how many times I heard, man, I wish this was over with. Man, I just, I'm ready to, I want to, give me a plea. Everybody wanted a plea bar. Everybody wanted to hurry up and get it over with. Instead of, I don't know, maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe it's, it's just, uh, I shouldn't have to take a plea for something that didn't happen. I shouldn't have to lay down so the prosecutor can get a little mark on the wall and say, I got another conviction. You know. And they they like, didn't even after the uh, after the appeal. No, it was and, and I told Jerry Beaver uh, after he took. I said he said I know you're not going to take a plea. I said fine, we got that straight. Let's tell him how Jerry Beaver got involved. Uh, let me give you a little wisdom from Bob, if I may. Uh, we go downtown, Fayetteville, Durham, Charlotte. We pick out a hundred people. They got to be citizens of the United States because we're most of the time we the people of the United States are raised with different values and whatnot. Uh, so we're going to line up a hundred people and we're going to give each one of them a million dollars. Going to send them on their way. My philosophy is from my PhD degree <laughs> is 75% of them will be appreciative. 25% of them are going to complain about something about that million dollars. <laughs> Either they got a check for a million dollars or they got $20 bills for a million dollars or something. Now, they might not complain about it outwardly, but in their heart, they're going to complain. If you take a, a vote today and you get a 100% unanimous vote, somebody's lying. Because somebody in their heart is saying, I don't want to do it, I'm not, uh-uh. Or I'm going to look bad if I, if I vote. That good-looking girl over there, if I vote, she's going to think I'm nothing. Well, she probably thinks that anyway. But that's, <laughs> but that's, that's my philosophy on any given situation, 75, 25. Now, a prosecutor is going to say, well, where did you get that figure? How come, okay, maybe it's 80, 20, maybe it's 90, 10, but 75, 25 is my figure and I like it and that's my story. <laughs> In central prison, if there had not been 75, 25 that believed in me, I'd have been dead in 30 days. 75% of the people in prison believed me innocent. And the reason I asked about, I guess asked a guy that one day that had been there for years. I said, why? He said, don't you know why we, we know that you're innocent? I said, no. He said, because anytime there's two or more people involved in a crime, somebody's going to do what? Snitch. It's a given. Look at the Michael Jordan case. Well, it was Daniel Green and uh, Daniel Green. Yeah. yeah. And which one of them could run quick enough to the DA yeah, to get it, you know. Yeah. There were seven defendants and nobody testified against anybody. He said, that's how we knew that you weren't guilty. And other people took pleas. Five seven. took pleas. Right? Everybody but two and dog? No. Uh, Betsy, who I was married to at that time, she took a plea. Scott took a plea. Dawn was convicted and had life sentences. Her 
conviction was overturned when mine was, and the other three, they dis just dismissed the charge. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say about uh, after the appeal was over, the prosecutor suddenly remembered that there was, oh, you know what, there's this another kid that we just remembered that Bob molested this other kid too. And so they uh, indicted him. I think he got mm -hmm. as far as indictment. Um, and Bob was under that for two years. two years before they finally dismissed that charge. And so... Every time had I had a hard time giving up. Every time I was arrested, they they called and I'd go turn myself in, no problem. I was arrested five times, turn myself in. When they couldn't get me to <coughs> take a plea in '89, I think it was uh, what's what's the holiday in September? Memorial Day, Labor, Labor, Day? Labor Day. My wife at that time, Betsy, was was living with her parents. And our daughter was living with her. And I, I say the Gestapo because that's basically what they did. Instead of calling her and saying, we got an arrest warrant for you, come turn yourself in, they went to her parents' house and arrested her in front of our daughter and put handcuffs on her when a simple phone call would have said, come turn yourself in. So there's another thing about the prosecutors. If I had, uh, and we're talking about, like I said, the prosecutor said many, many times, Bob Kelly may have molested as many as 90 children. Well, let's say I did, just suppose. How many would come home on the day that something happened and report it to a parent? Half of them? Quarter? How about 10%? How about 1%? How about one child out of 90? None. Zero. How many children came home from the daycare on the day that supposedly something happened and they were bleeding because of it? If you read about this stuff, mm -hmm. the things that we supposedly did to these children were, were knives, uh, sticks, penises, uh, rectums, vaginas, everything, everywhere. Sharks. Sharks, that's right. Sharks. How many came home on the day that something supposedly happened? Bleed. None. Or had any physical evidence when they were examined? None. None. And all these children went to different doctors. And I, I have a hard time saying Edenton. I say it Evilville. <laughs> but different doctors. How many saw abuse? None. Yet the prosecutor was so intent on getting a conviction so they could look good, I reckon. I, I don't know what their reckoning was. Or maybe they had never seen anybody that was innocent came and, and they didn't recognize it. I don't know. But the prosecutors failed in their job. The doctors at UNC Chapel Hill, bless their sorry hearts, mm -hmm. testified against me at, at my trial. They didn't do their job. The therapist didn't do their job. You put that in quotes. Air quotes around the therapist. The prosecutor picked out three different therapists to interview the children, and they all had previous experience with prosecutors, and the prosecutor knew which therapist would give them the uh, evidence they wanted. And every, I think every child that went to those three therapists said something happened. Eventually, is that right? Oh, yeah, uh, eventually. None of them said anything happened at first. Every child that went to an independent therapist, nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some, some kids had moved away to Charlotte or yeah. someplace and, were, and, were, and their parents heard about this from afar and 
and got concerned and had the doctor talk to them or the therapist or somebody, yeah, nothing, nothing. But the, the prosecutor, uh, and I know y'all get tired of hearing me talking about a sorry prosecutor, but they lied to me continuously. Uh, if you do this, we won't do, do such as I would say. If you do this, we won't arrest you anymore. If, uh, if you go be psychologically evaluated, and see, I'm, I'm a high school graduate, and I got some big words for y'all. If you go be psychologically evaluated, and the evaluation says that you don't have tendency to molest children, we'll dismiss the charge. I say, okay. So I go to Fayetteville, where my mother lived at that time, and I see a psychologist there. I can't remember the lady's name. And I went two or three sessions with her, and she said, I want you to go to University of Georgia. My professor at University of Georgia is Dr. Adams. And go down there and have him test you and see what he says. Well, I had to pay for this out of my pocket. It was $1,500. I said, okay. So I go down there, and he puts me on this penile plethysmograph. Peter yeah. Meter would call it. Anybody know what that is? Little tiny uh, blood pressure cup. <laughs> Looks like a condom with the center cut out, and you put it over your penis. And you sit in a chair, kind of like taking the polygraph, and they play movies uh, of homosexual, of heterosexual, men with men, women with men, women, all of different kind of movies. Uh, they didn't have any movies of children. They had pictures of children that had been confiscated by law enforcement, and they had given to the, this was University of Georgia. Uh, and after the test was over, Dr. Adams said, he said, you're the best I've ever had. Or either you're faking it, he said, and there ain't no way to fake it because the thing about this test is it emits some kind of, before the brain even knows it, it's telling the graph, yeah, I'm interested in this, yeah, I'm interested in that, whatnot. So I went through that, he said, uh, in fact, he testified for me at my trial. Got back, went to the doctor in Fedville one more time, she says, uh, I'm through with you. And about that time I get another call from uh, Betsy, she said, you need to come back to Evilville, they're gonna arrest you again. So I did, and that was in June of 89, and I stayed once I was arrested that time, I stayed incarcerated until September, I think, 23rd of 95. Please do. I just, I just want the, the room to know that this was a period, not that it wouldn't happen today, but this really to reinforce what Lou and um, Powell and Mark Montgomery are saying, a period of time where we really collectively engaged in massive suspension of Right? So we just, there was this notion that you're supposed to believe the children, but, and that children who had been abused were very reluctant to disclose the abuse. So it was believed to be um, uncorrosive to elicit allegations from the children by. It's therapeutic for them to get it out of there. It's therapeutic, but you might interview the, the child 43 times. So 42 times they might deny, and 43, and you go, oh, finally, <laughs> finally they divulged. And research since that period shows that, um, contrary to the belief of the time, children will lie about large and small things. There was a belief children wouldn't lie. Children couldn't speak, it was believed children couldn't speak about things about which they didn't have knowledge, you know, or, or experience. So they couldn't talk about penises unless they had seen a penis. So it was just this crazy, crazy time from the mid 80s till shortly after. 2019. 2019. <laughs> <laughs> mid 80s to the period ended, well wait, it's not over. It's but not I mean this, this kind of satanic, I mean the satanic abuse period and yeah. we've had cases in our clinic as, as, as some of you know that didn't have the satanic elements and I 
have been known to say, I wish they did, yeah. right? Because yeah. the more outlandish the allegations, at least today you can get people, like we had a case that involved levitation, right? That it was, it was alleged that there was levitation in the case. I've seen um, that happen. <laughs> I'm not yeah, I, I, I've seen levitation. The, <laughs> many of the elements that, uh, that ended up with Bob being in prison are still out there. The prosecutors are, have dialed it back. They don't do the large scale prosecutions, mass prosecutions. Um, and to their credit, they, some of the more outlandish uh, allegations don't get followed up on, but there's still a believe the children um, atmosphere out there. Um, uh, so it's not over yet. Did you take questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> what? Well, I wanted to pick up on a point that you made, Mark, about how it's still going on today, and Bob was raising a lot of critiques about almost every uh, player in the prosecution, including prosecutors, therapists. Uh, he sort of raises questions about what, if any, efforts have been made to change the court procedures to to minimize the allowance for court courts to hear child testimony, to require more uh, credentials for therapists, to, uh, in, I don't know, maybe select rather than elect prosecutors or have some sort of uh, retention election or something. Has, has anything been done in response legislatively or procedurally in court, criminal court procedure? The deck is still heavily stacked against the defense in cases like this. A defense expert or lawyer is not entitled to talk to the kid. Um, and having not talked to the kid, the defense, uh, w until very recently, the defense expert wasn't allowed to testify because she hadn't, or he hadn't interviewed the kid he was gonna talk about. Um, discovery uh, is still very strict. Uh, expert vouching is the current thing where uh, hand selected still that still happens. That there's there is a stable of prosecutor prosecution oriented experts who testify over and over again and find various ways to convince the jury that what the kid says, no matter how outlandish, is true. Um, as I said, defense experts are it's very difficult for a defense expert to meet that kind of testimony. Um, what else? I mean, <laughs> let me let me say. This. Please do. I think that it's got to get a bad feeling. I change. If you want change, it's got to start at the attorney general's office. And when you've got the thought, I reckon, of the attorney general's office that when a case is reversed in the appellate court. The Attorney General's Office automatically appeals it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Whether there's, even if there's evidence that the people are innocent, they automatically appeal it. And our Supreme Court grants it about 90% of the time to the state, grants it less than about 10% of the time to the defense if they've lost in the Court of Appeals. And until that changes with the Attorney General's office, you, I don't think you're gonna see any, any betterment because the Attorney General is the role model for every district attorney in the state, right? And they took the lead in prosecuting Bob, too. I don't know if we brought that part out. And also in the, another case that uh, you got, some of you guys are familiar with the Junior Chandler case out, out of the mountain, the, prosecute, the same Attorney General took over that case, too. It's like I said earlier, the. the Attorney General is a politician. The district attorneys are a politician. Uh, I don't mean to stomp on y'all's parade. There's not a politician that I know of that I got any respect for from, from here to none of them. Because once they, once they get elected, heck with everything, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And until we get an Attorney General with the Bowels. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say cojones, but that's all right. Uh, to do what's right, you, 
you know, and maybe one of you guys out there will be the attorney general one of these days and do that. I hope so. Any other questions? All right, I have one. So as students, you're already suggesting maybe becoming an attorney general and having the cojones to actually change this, but do you have any other advice, whether it's working with journalists to get the media out or working with our, our clients or working with attorneys and the libraries? Like, do you have any advice for us in terms of dealing with this type of crime or case? Well, I think Oprah Bacall's uh, documentary shows the power of the press in, in changing. I think, it, I think it changed the, the view of the Court of Appeals of this case. And I say that because when, when I went in for oral argument, uh, the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, who was also presiding over the panel, said, uh, hey, can you step outside for a minute with me? And me, not the, me and the Attorney General, but just me, and I'm looking around and got to go, so yes, sir, I go. And he takes me outside in the hallway and starts telling me what it was that he, the issues that he wanted me to talk about during the oral argument. And that's the first and only time that's ever happened. Um, so I accused him of being unjudicious and no, I, I, said, I, said, I said, thank you very much for letting me know in advance that I'm gonna win, and I did. But I think in large part, it was the change in the public perception of these cases brought on by that frontline show. Whatever the reason, Little Rascals was the last major satanic ritual abuse daycare case. Yes. It just sort of stopped. Another, another possible, possible reason is that uh, repressed memory therapists were getting sued, which uh, seemed to diminish the appetite for that kind of uh, case. I think and another it, reason is that researchers, psych, psychologists in, in academic settings really started at that point, um, a little bit before, but really at that point, because of Little Rats, like um, at Johns Hopkins, the woman who cut her teeth on, what is her name, uh, cut her teeth on your case, she testified that she, in your case, but didn't do a very good job. And she Maggie said, Brooke. Yeah, Maggie Brooke. She went back and dedicated her life to researching the issues that had, to that point, been uninvestigated. Um, so I do, I do think that I, I agree with with Mark's point that these cases still occur. There just there's a, there is a little more in our toolkit yes. now to attack uh, yeah. these, these kinds mm -hmm. of cases. Yes, and um, <laughs> from a defense lawyer standpoint, one of, one of the things I preach is what's called, I don't know if you've heard, treatise cross-examination, which you do with experts. You, 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 you study up on the science. If you don't have your own expert, or if you don't have your, an expert that's uh, willing to testify, which is more likely, they can at least point you in the direction so you know what the science is, so when you're getting up there to cross-examine the state's expert, you can bring out the fact that they're full of uh, whatever yeah. Latin for shit is. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> She's like Luther. Yeah. That's his spouse, so we can wonder in there. Yeah. Two parts of this yeah. great legal scheme. Yeah. Science Drive is a really good location for a law school. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think that the I think that the state will eventually, <clears throat> excuse me, own up and, and apologize. Uh, I don't think I'll be alive to see it because the history has proven in our state that they generally wait 50, 75 years and then they come up and say, oh, that was terrible, we're sorry. And, and uh, it's just like with the women that they sterilized back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, they came up what, in the 90s and 2000s and said, we made a mistake. I think it, it'll eventually happen, bless you, sweet cheeks. <laughs> uh, but is there a pardon of innocence pending right now in the governor's office? A petition for a pardon of innocence? Not pending, no. Uh, uh, has one been? I, you can only go back after, you know. I, I don't remember. I know Mike Spivey and, and I were talking about it. And I, for some reason, Mike poo pooed the idea. I can't really remember. You see, because the 
attorney general would have to okay it or something. And or he's, wouldn't yeah. wouldn't local D, wouldn't wouldn't uh, uh, your girlfriend have to approve it or something? Hmm. The well, female you process. You file a petition for pardon of innocence with the governor's office, and the governor has the authority to cite the commutation of pardon of innocence. But one of the things they that office does is they consult with the prosecutors to see what the prosecutor's position is on the pardon of innocence, which of course you know it's already political and then it becomes more politicized and more difficult to obtain. And that but would I be the. I think having one there, even if it's denied, is helpful <laughs> in kind of for the you know if they're political, we can be political. I think at that time the governor was Mike Easley. And uh, he had already said uh, that Bob Kelly should never, as attorney general, should never get out of prison, that, you know, this, so that might be why I'm, might, I don't know. Are there any other, any questions? No. Okay. So I just wanted to ask then about the, I would say, what was the community's reaction after you were released? The community of... Uh, yeah. I didn't go back. I don't know. I wouldn't. Uh, Do you know what's going on? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. they, David, did you? What's the question? Uh, what, the, the community response after Bob was was uh, exon was uh, cleared. Uh, I don't know any polling data, but a lot of anecdotal reporting suggested there was a lot of relief. I think a lot of people saw that innocence lost. TV show, and I think, as you said, changed a lot of public perception. Did, did you guys try to talk to some of the, the kids or the parents after the fact when you were working on this? I consulted with Bob on how to get to the kids, how to get to the parents, how to get, I, if you got a suggestion, I'd yeah. have. Well, they showed up at the oral argument. So. They what? They all showed up at the oral argument in the Court of Appeals. Oh. Not the kids, the parents. I got, a, I got a phone call about a year ago. Well, I placed a classified ad in the Elizabeth City paper asking any child witnesses who wanted to talk to give me a call. I got one call from a woman who was insistent that she had in fact been abused by Bob, but she could not give me any details. It was like it was a fog that she had bought into. And she called again the next night and then a couple of nights longer and she she could never come up with any specifics. Uh, and by the time she was through talking, she said, well, I think Bob was guilty, but uh, the other ones I don't think were guilty. Yeah, but I want to say that the reason that people, that the, these, quote, victims, the air quote victims, they are told when they're two, three, four, five years old that they've been abused. They've been told that when they were interviewed the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. They absolutely come to believe it. They are un reliable historians at that point. They cannot, so, you know, a decision, yeah, I just, you know, I, it's, it's actually Mr. Kelly's, Bob, Bob's point, feeling sorry for these 90 children, right? These 90 children, some number of them believe that they were abused by whole daycare staff. I mean, this is tragic. We, as the adults in the room when these allegations arise, or the adults in the jury, or the investigators, or the psychologists, or the lawyers, whatever, we have to really put them to the proof. It is not enough just to believe these allegations. I, my, and I'm saying this partly because I have a two and a half year old granddaughter now. And she can convince you, as I told Lou Powell this morning, I think I told you this, I don't know, that, that, that Cookie Monster bit Abby. If you know who those two characters are, they're the characters <laughs> from Sesame Street. And she looks at you with all earnestness and furrowed brow, and you are ready to indict. <laughs> <laughs> but bring him here. He's gone down. I mean, that is the tragedy. And I, I just think if I had reinforced that with, with his granddaughter uh, again and again and again, or made it about her, she would come to believe that she had been abused. And that is, and, and if you've never, I don't encourage you to go to Edenton, but it's this bucolic little seaside town very insular. I know where your daycare center was. I know that town pretty well. Sister lived in Hereford for years. That I, it just is, I can see how they just, um, it ran like a, a, an absolute contagion uh, through the town. I am sorry, uh, and we are all sorry that you went through this and you know, you, that you stood up to it. 
is suffered for standing up to it, is uh, speaks to who you are. And I just want to thank you for coming here and telling your story. I had never met you before, so it is my honor and privilege to have met you today. Let I know, me, the, I know me, the other people up let, here. Let me say one more thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I know it's quitting time. Yeah, they can find you, though. <laughs> if, and some of y'all believe in God and some of you don't. That's fine. And this is not in the Bible. But if God came to me, he said, we're going to go back 30 years. And we're going to come to a fork in the road. And you can take this left fork if you want to. And that's going to be the road of the unknown. That's going to be the road of you don't know what's going to happen. Or you can take the right road. And you will go through exactly what you've been through all over again. The hell that you've been through, the, the death threats every day in prison that you've been through, you will go through that. And whichever you choose, when you start your journey, I'll wipe your memory off and you just have to go through it again. I'm very happy where I am today. I'm very happy with what I have. I'm very happy with what I don't have. I believe that if I took that road to the left, that my grandchildren would not be alive today because the, the odds are my son meeting his lady that had his children would be a million, billion to one. So is it worth it? I wouldn't, I wouldn't raise my hand and volunteer and say, I'll be glad to go through <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm happy where I am. I'm happy with what I have. I'm happy with whom I'm living with. I mean, if, if you could meet Maddie, and they, they know Maddie. She's, she's a better Bond diggity than Mark is. Oh, so man. She is, she, is a, she is a sweetheart. She loves me to death, and I don't know why. When I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, I say, who's an old man I'm looking at in the mirror? But she, she you know, I, and the day I die, and I, I've told her, I said, don't mourn for me. Just thank God that I've outlived. Look at the people I've outlived. Look at the, look at the joy that I've had. Uh, I can go, I'm 70 years old, and I can go back 60 years, and I'm the, I can remember classmates that died 60 years ago. And wouldn't they love to go through what I had to go through to be able to live to 60 years? Absolutely. So, and one more thing, and I'll shut up. And no matter how bad you think you got it, there's always somebody that's got it worse off. Mm -hmm. uh. All right. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Good job,